And this is the variation they observed on the protein and oil content. And you can see that across these uh, almost 100, 100 cultivars, you got variation at about uh, 8 post percentage point in protein and almost uh, 7 uh, percentage, point, percentage point in, uh, in oil. And this is for all, all, the plant, all the plant species. Another example, uh, historical example, some people have pioneered to, to, the, to try to, to track the evolution of uh, wheat, uh, no, not wheat, maize cultivars from the 1920s to the, to the 2000. And this, what they found is that um, when they, they look at the starch and the protein content, what they found is that there was, uh, the, the, the selection worked a lot, worked, a lot, worked very hard to get better yields. But the side effect was that they increased the starch content, but the side effect that uh, it decreased the protein, the protein content. And there is a little bit, something weird in this paper, because you see the, the value on the right about the, the protein content. It is it's very, very high. So there is, in this paper, they, they introduce a source of variation, probably about the method, um, the, protein, the, the method of protein, and they include in the paper. So the, this is an example of uh, uh, variation caused by genetics, and you have a little bit of variation caused by, uh, by analysis. Environment. Uh, so we got these already vari variable uh, plants and seeds and, uh, and forage. And the environmental conditions are very, of course, very important. Everything, everything, everything is going to, to, influ to influence uh, the proteins, the fiber, the oil, the mineral content, the anti-nutritional values, and everything is going to influence uh, these contents. So the weather, the temperature, the soil type, the moisture, uh, the soil moisture, the air moisture, for instance, for instance there was a, a short paper recently about in Ohio uh, where they found that um, different, the, the concentration of grain protein was, in, was heavily influenced by, um, by, by soil moisture. So there was uh, two to three points, per two to three points depending on the soil moisture, on soil moisture. Uh, other cultivation conditions, of course, uh, from the field preparation, sowing, then sowing preparation, density, irrigation, drainage, uh, weed and pest control, fertilization, aid or harvest, mode of harvest, and of course, storage, uh, the length of storage, humidity during storage, um, and so on. So everything, everything is going to be important. The, the end result is that if we take, for instance, uh, the starch versus protein variability of the main uh, cereals, uh, so oats, barley, wheat, maize, uh, I could have had rice and rye and triticale and so on, the same issue. So we can see that there is uh, a pretty high variation in starch, about uh, some, uh, more than 10%, 10-15%, and also a quite nice variation in protein, uh, for instance, uh, about uh, eight, uh, up to 8% for each, 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 each type of grain. Something which is quite known, so the effect, for instance, of uh, nitrogen fertilization on, uh, on wheat, uh, on the content of wheat protein. So you can see that um, it grows, so it di is directly linked to uh, nitrogen fertilization, but it is also linked to, uh, to the moisture regime of the, of the climate. Just what, what's going to happen with climate change? This is a really very recent paper that try to examine, examine what would happen with climate change and what adaptation uh, would expect. So the idea was that um, there were global potential benefits in terms of uh, uh, wheat, in terms of yield, uh, and included protein yield, but there are negative impacts uh, from the rising temperature and, uh, and rainfall, particularly in, um, in, a low, low, in uh, low rainfall regions. So, even if we, when people are going to try to use types that will be better at handling, at handling the, the rise temperature, uh, there may be some uh, negative effects on crude protein. And this is another, uh, another issue that, we'll, that we may expect, another cause of, of, of variation. Um, another example of the effect of uh, cultivation processes and um, about alfalfa protein. So I, I made a graph about uh, the harvest date and the cut, and you see how complex it is. 
So we got the first, second cut, third cut, fourth cut, and every cut has its, has its different pattern of influence about, uh, on crude protein. And uh, the people who, who produce this alfalfa are from the, the eastern, eastern part of France. And there are also the people the kind of agriculture who are also making champagne. And you know, uh, Pierre, you talk about champagne, how they assemble champagne, assemble different uh, vintage to make champagne. And they do the same for alfalfa. They take all these different alfalfas and try to make uh, a very categorized uh, versions of alfalfa with 17% protein, 18% protein, 19% protein, using and their buffer variability using that. They got this very huge variability uh, on the protein content, crude fiber content, and everything. And they try to make a product which is which which have which, which has more precise uh, precise composition. And I talked about protein, but this is the same for carotene, for instance. So. Uh, the effect of uh, harvest date and cut can be seen on, a, on, on every, every component of the, of the plant. Processes. Processes are very, of course, very important. Uh, you take the raw grain, and then there are two kind of things you can do with it. First, you can try to, to apply processes that will imp improve their nutritional value, or you can use the grain to produce food. Uh, and this uh, process will yield, will yield a co-product. Typically, the process that try to improve nutrition, nutrition quality are going, like, are going to, spe to target specify uh, precise specification so we can have a product of limited variability and with better nutritional value. And these processes are like heating, flaking, and so on, or the hurling or grinding. And you will get product which, which with a better, a better, a lesser variability, with a controlled amount of nutrients and typically a lesser amount of nutritional uh, factors. But still, uh, there are lots of unknowns uh, about the processes, and uh, these processes might vary uh, depending on the time. So the people who make these products may change the processes, and the next year you will end up with a different product with different specifications. So va variation uh, may be a little, a little bit uh, lower, but it still exists. And the process that yield byproducts, uh, what we need to remember is that the composition of the byproducts of the co-products is primarily, primarily driven by the manufacturer of the main product. So what people target is a yield of oil, a yield of starch, of sugar, of a fruit juice. And the co-products, more often than not, is, well, it's a, a secondary product. So the target is on the oil, the target is on the is on the sugar, but not on the co-products. Of course, the manufacturers may try to make uh, using, by improving the, the, the quality of the byproducts, may, may try to make it uh, better. But more many often, uh, we have lots of factor variation and, uh, and much lesser control on the, on the variability of the final, uh, and on the final composition of the, of the byproducts. We also have a huge diversity of names, which is a real problem. And uh, as a result, the byproducts, the co-products are very, very, very viable. So a few examples here. For instance, if we take the, the, the process to make uh, alco made alcohol, uh, you see that there are lots of steps involved in the process. And each step, each variation of the step is going to, to result in a variation of the byproduct. So for instance, if we, we, at the end, we have a mixture of the solubles and, and, the, and the wet drains, and the, the proportion of solubles and wet grains is going to, to result in a different product. And of course, some, some, dried, uh, some, some dried dispersed grains are made of different species. Uh, they may be of maize, of wheat, or, or, or mixtures of maize and wheat and sorghum and so on. So the result is that we, get, we, can, we have what we call DDGS is a, an entire family of products. So if I take maize, for instance, and there will be some uh, very, very important talk this afternoon about cereals, but this is maize and all the byproducts, and you can see that there is a huge diversity of products coming from, from the single grain, and every single byproduct, co-product, is itself viable. If I take only the, the gluten feed on the right, protein versus fat, uh, you see the, the, the gluten meal, is 60% protein, but in fact, it's something between 50 and 70. And uh, on the other side of the graph, we've got the, the maize germs, uh, the crude germs, not, not extracted, and uh, we got 
crude fat content from 30 to 50. So got very, very uh, large variation between each category of byproducts. Uh, same thing for wheat. Uh, this is a graph that shows not only the, 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 red, the red dots on the right are the wheat grain. And you see that the wheat grain is variable, but it's much less variable than the, the, all, than the other byproducts. So the, the, the big yellow banana, uh, it's all the middling byproducts. Well, not the middling, but the, middling, the main, the, the, the middlings, the shorts, and then you've got the brands and the feed flour. And this is driven by the expression of starch, but what we call middlings, so the, the big banana in the middle, it's huge. The variation is about between 20 and 60 percent protein. And we, we can cut it in uh, different categories, but uh, it's still difficult. And it's, it's a continuity. There is no product when you can say, well, this is brand, this is middlings. Uh, and also, the, the, the manufacturers, uh, they take all the output of the, of the meal and mix the, and mix the output to create uh, more or less specific products. So it's a so what we call brand, what we call middling, what we call short may vary from one manufacturer to another. The yellow dots are the milling byproducts and the green dots are the starch, the starch byproducts and the blue dots are the distillery byproducts. So if we can look at the green, the green dogs, the wheat gluten feed, which is a byproduct of the starch industry, and see that it's actually a series of products. And I, in fact, in this case, it is two manufacturers. And the, the two manufacturers that produce, that both produce starch, wheat starch, but they have different processes, and the different processes result in different products. Uh, one is about 30% uh, starch, and the other is 20% uh, starch. And with also a difference in a uh, significant, significant difference uh, in protein content. If I look at distillers, with distillers, uh, this is a little bit different, but we have two different processes. One where the grain is uh, is kept whole at the beginning of the, of, the, of the process, and one where the grain is milled and the bran is reintroduced at the, end of the at the end of the process. And these two processes give different products. One, is, one which is much, the, much higher in, in starch, and one where the starch is much, well, much better extracted. So there is a little less starch, less than 7% starch, and a higher content in, uh, in protein. A product which is which should be easy, which is uh, the sunflower meal. Sunflower meal is the byproduct of the oil extraction, and the, the crude and protein content of the sunflower meal is primarily driven by, by the dehulling. But even, that, even there, you can see that uh, this is a graph about crude protein, crude fiber versus protein. Uh, you can see that there is a continuity between dehulling and not dehulling. But uh, so we've got the, the picture of the, the raw, the, the hulled, Hulled soybean meal and the de and the dehulled or partially dehulled soybean meal. Of course, the dehulling is also a variable process. So we got you got soybean meals that are entirely dehulled, some that are only partially dehulled. There is genetic variation that makes the hulls more or less able to be removed. Uh, and so in the end, we got not exactly two categories, but a continuum of a continuum uh, between the totally uh, dehulled soybean meal and the not at all dehulled soybean meal. And uh, with a quite large, uh, so, so, so and the protein, the protein content is quite large because even in the, for the held, so for the non dehulled soybean meal, got protein between about 20 to 30, and um, for the dehulled or partially dehulled soybean meal, it's uh, between something so between 30 or 40, even f more than 40 for very, very uh, specific types of uh, of soybean meal. And this is an, an extreme example. Uh, which is a rice bran. So rice bran comes from many, many, many different uh, ways of transforming rice into, into starch, into oil, into, into uh, edible rice, and so on. And all these, pro all these manufacturing processes uh, output products that are often named by different, that are known by different names, but uh, more than often they, they are called rice bran. And you can see that uh, rice bran, when you look at the main uh, analysis, uh, protein, in this case it is crude fiber and, uh, and crude, crude fiber and crude fat. Uh, so the rice bran can be a very, very uh, good 
energy, energy uh, feed because it's going to, to, to contain a high amount of fat and a very low amount of crude fiber. But if the, this brand contains a lot of hulls because uh, the, the, the manufacturer put back all the hulls into the rice bran, so you end up with a product which is 30% uh, crude fiber. Uh, and I could have made a similar graph with a protein, with a protein and with a starch and everything in, the four, in three or four dimension. And the rice bran is actually a sort of galaxy uh, of products. Uh, and sometimes the variations are more complicated to, to understand. In this particular case, it's soybean meal and uh, the graph is about protein and lysine. And uh, on the red dots are the regular uh, soybean meal. And we have a quite nice uh, relation between uh, lysine and protein. And the red dots are organic soybean meal. And uh, what we found was that uh, the organic soybean meal have a lesser and significantly lesser ratio of lysine on crude protein than the regular ones. And we don't have a very good explanation for that. Um, possibly it's genetics, possibly it's processes, because the process to make organic soybean meal uh, it doesn't, it's not going to use exam for, extra, for oil extraction, for instance. Um, it could be different types of handling the, uh, handling the seeds. And, but the, the net result of all the sources of the variation is that we have a very important uh, difference between organic soybean meal and uh, uh, conventional soybean meal. So we have all these sorts of variation uh, are combined uh, to get a product with a lower, uh, a lower value uh, about life. Last aspect of last source, but I won't go much into this because it's it's a very huge prop, it's, a, it's a huge continent of variation. But it is not something that within the feed. It's something that a variation a variability that is added after the, once the feed exists. Uh, this is analysis. Um, analysis, of course, when you measure something, is there is there are variation. Uh, there are different methods. Uh, the methods may be more or less repeatable and more or less reproducible. Uh, I just illustrated by the difference between um, protein or starch content measured by polarimetry and by enzymatic method. And we, we know that uh, polarimetry is mo much more forgiving and gives more higher uh, starch content, typically between two or three percent more uh, percentage points than enzymatic method. But this is true for many, many uh, analyses. So, and of course, this variation may or may not be. It can be controlled, but uh, it, it's, it's something which is not within, within the material. Another sort of variation is the dry matter. Um, uh, depending on the dry matter, you might have different values of the fee, but actually it's variable in the dry matter. So, uh, and we've seen papers, we've seen uh, value, and we've seen data where uh, what seemed to be variable was just the variation of the dry matter. So we should remember that all what I show uh, about the, con I mainly show the, uh, the chemical composition and everything has an, has an effect on the nutritive value. So when we have a variation on the crude fiber, it will have a direct effect on digestibility. And this graph is about uh, the general effect of, uh, I guess it's NDF here, on, on the digestibility of um, energy in the different species. And every, every species works a little bit different, but any time you are going to have a one percentage point of NDF more, it's going to have a detrimental effect on digestibility. Uh, some, likewise, the fat content, fat is bringing energy. So, for instance, if we have the, an expeller rapeseed meal, an expeller rapeseed meal, the, 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 the fat, the oil content is going to range between 5% and 20%. So, there are very huge variation on, uh, on, the, on the fat content, and it has a direct effect first on the growth energy. And these are calculated values, not measured values, but measured values which are the same. Uh, so, the, the, the blue dots are the growth energy, and the, the, red, the yellow dots are the metabolizable energy. So, when people talk about expeller, um, an expert uh, soybean, an expert uh, uh, rapeseed meal, uh, we should take in effect the precise amount of fat because it's, it's going to have very uh, direct effect on, on nutritional value. Uh, last example about uh, the heating process. The heating process is going to, depending on the, on the species, is going to have direct effect on uh, protein degradability, on protein digestibility, and also, for instance, this particular case on the and, on 
nutritional and key nutritional factors. Uh, so this graph is about the antitrypsin activity in soybeans. Uh, the, 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 the left bar is the uh, untreated soybeans, uh, so the red ones, and even for the treated soybeans, you see that there is a very, very important variability in what's left in terms of uh, anti-nutritional anti factors in, um, in the soy in the, in the, in the seed. So, uh, not yet a conclusion, but uh, the feeds are uncertain. There is an uncertainty, which is mainly because they are, these are highly viable biological materials. Uh, the feed names are often poor descriptors. Uh, sometimes, well, a cereal is a cereal, a grain is a grain, but when, we, when we're talking about brands, when we're talking about co-products, uh, the name of the co-products may not be as precise uh, as, we, as we want. Um, and when we got the, the feed, the, the feed in the, in the storage, uh, we often lack uh, information about the feed. Uh, we have the name, but sometimes we don't, have, we don't know where it comes from, we don't have the country, we don't have, and we don't have the processes, and we don't have the genetics, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, information missing. Uh, analysis is also one of the dark problems, uh, because it, it creates artificial variability. Uh, mitigating variation, so this is the topic of the day, of the, to these two days, so I'm not going to, 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 to go into detail, but obviously we, we need to learn about the feed, so we need to know that rice bran is not just a rice bran, but it's, it's a, a family of products. Uh, we need to collect information about each bag, each batch, where, 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 where it's from and when, uh, what is the product exactly. We need to do real-time analysis, uh, including from chemical or NIR. Um, we need to be able to predict the equation based on, uh, on the chemical composition and on in vitro or in, or in vitro measurement. And other speakers will talk uh, later about uh, other ways to control variability, about uh, buffering variability using enzymes, or about um, dealing with variability using formulation. Uh, just, uh, I, I was talking about the equation, but uh, we'll be designing, we'll be uh, making a software, online software that will be able to, uh, which, which is called Feed Dynamics. And uh, this software will be able, for instance, uh, to use your composition of, of your feed, your, your batch, and turn it into, uh, a, comp into a nutritional value for pigs, poultry, and other, other, other species. This will, this, will, this will be available uh, in a few months. So leveraging diversity, so the, cho in fact, the choice I, I show for the rice brand, the rice brand is very valuable, but actually many of these co-products are families, and uh, so the choice is actually larger than it seems, and the uh, and quote about uh, there is no uh, bad products, so there is bad use, but it's possible within each, within each family to identify, uh, so I took the graph and I put uh, circles around each sub-products, and each sub-products once it's, it's correctly identified, it's usable, it's not so variable, it's usable for a particular uh, use in, in, specific, in specific species. So um, once uh, it is properly assessed, once it is categorized, you can use uh, this product. Five minutes, okay. It's, oh, it's okay. Um, we should be reminded too that there are many potential feeds from plants. Uh, we often talk about a very limited number, number products. Uh, even today, I mostly talk about soybean, about cereals, uh, but there are many, many plants and many feeds that are underused and undervalued around, around the planet. Uh, we've been working on Feedipedia. Feedipedia is a worldwide encyclopedia of animal feeds, and it is uh, made by INRA, CIRA, AFN, and FAO, and with concerning with ADCO. And, uh, and Feedipedia, we are trying to to try to, to write data sheets about each possible, each possible feed. And what we found by, when we made this, uh, the database, the database behind Feedipedia, uh, if we take all the samples we collected around, uh, in many, many years, uh, we get more or less 30 plant species. And 30 plant species, uh, this is bulk of what we got uh, in our samples. Uh, I'm not saying it's representative of, of the world, but uh, most of the feeds uh, come from a limited number of, of species. And in Philippedia, uh, we got 1% of samples that come from 400 species. And I'm, and I'm just talking about uh, feed material, about raw materials. I'm not talking about forages, because forages 
it's two, it's 2 thousand species. <laughs> so it's a totally different universe. But uh, even for thin, thin materials, uh, concentrate and so on, there are at least 400 species that exist and that can be, can be used uh, to feed animals. So, uh, it is possible also to leverage this uh, diversity by looking at local, local species and grains of legumes, local byproducts, and uh, of course, all these products are less known than maize or the soybean meal, so we, we need analysis and we need um, evaluation uh, of the value and variability. So, for instance, this is the, the cashew nut meal, which is a very nice product with uh, more than 4 protein, low fiber. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, it's, it's a nice product, but it's not very well known. Okay, so uh, my conclusion is, uh, well, we can find value in variation, and the, the, the whole day, the, the whole two days will be about this. Uh, we have to face it, it exists, it's very large, but uh, it's, it's a problem, but uh, we'll see that there are, it can become an asset uh, once it's known and, uh, and studied and estimated and so on. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.